So first of all, I want to welcome everyone to the first of two lectures today. So we'll have Jan speak uh, now and then uh, I guess uh, two hours after he finishes at, at 1 p.m. Eastern time, Jinho Bike will speak. Um, the format is as it's been, uh, mute yourself unless you have a question. And then if you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, shout it out. Um, alternatively, if it's a less pressing question or just a point of clarification, you can send a, a message through the chat, but just make sure you chat everybody because I don't think Jan is going to be able to multitask looking at the chat and responding while he gives his talk. Um, the uh, the one other piece of information I want to say is I, I sent a link in the chat. I'll send it maybe again if I, uh, in case it doesn't didn't show up, um, which has Jan's slides. So if you want to follow along um, that way, feel free. And the other thing is, um, so in addition to the these Friday lectures that we've been doing, uh, next week we will have an online summer school, which um, will run every day. Here's the link. It looks kind of lengthy, but anyway, if you click on that and go to mini course, you'll see information for the five mini course lectures that will be next week. Uh, you should feel free to attend any and all of them. Uh, of course, it will be through Zoom. Uh, and if you have any questions about that, just feel free to let me know. Okay, so without any more delay, um, Jan Fyodorov will speak on eigenvector statistics in non-normal random matrices. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Ivan and um, Alexei, for inviting me to give this uh, research lecture uh, in this uh, online environment. Um, my talk will consist of, of two parts. They are uh, related, but they will be uh, slightly different in emphasis and in nature. First part will be based on two papers uh, about uh, more or less related to uh, Geneva ensemble and its um, some modifications. Uh, um, and these, these papers are just shown on the screen. Uh, in the second part, I will try to give a flavor or maybe crash course in uh, applications of um, non self adjoint or non normal indeed uh, random matrices uh, for describing interesting physical phenomena of uh, chaotic scattering. And then I will uh, concentrate on slightly different uh, type of random matrices and try to tell uh, what is known about that um, rigorously or maybe mostly non-rigorously, but uh, informative. Um, okay, so um, uh, let me remind you what means uh, that matrix, matrix is uh, non-normal. So non-normal means uh, that it just does, does not commute with it um, uh, Hermitian joint. Uh, and uh, if one takes a generic uh, random matrix, uh, which is non-self-adjoint, Usually, they are non normal. Uh, and as we shall discuss, and this is one of the main uh, messages, uh, uh, which is by uh, no means new, it's well known, but it's uh, worth uh, emphasizing that eigenvalues of uh, non normal matrices are much more sensitive to any uh, perturbations in entries of the matrix or uh, in numerical mathematicians sometimes call this property ill conditioning. Um, just uh, to uh, set the stage for our discussion, uh, let me remind uh, that uh, non-self adjoint matrices have uh, in general, uh, to each eigenvalue correspond two sets of eigenvectors called traditionally left and right. And I will uh, denote left by L's and right by R's. I hope consistently, maybe I will make some um, change. I, I hope I won't uh, make a uh, change in notation from that, but it may happen since I combined several talks in one. Sometimes it happens. Um, so uh, these eigen problems for right and for left, uh, they are written here. 
Uh, for the right, it looks just a standard one. For the left, it's the same, but for a joint. Um, and uh, one always can uh, make a choice, and uh, this is one of possible choices, and I will follow this uh, convention, that left and right sets of eigenvectors uh, form a so-called bi-orthogonal set. So their uh, inner scalar products uh, form just uh, equal to one if uh, index i equal to j and uh, zero otherwise. So uh, why uh, this uh, left and right dichotomy is important for uh, the issue of conditioning or behavior under perturbation? Let us consider uh, perturbation of our uh, matrix X by some matrix uh, of, uh, say, uh, say, a fixed norm, maybe, maybe norm one, uh, and we control uh, the, the size of this or magnitude of this perturbation by uh, control parameter epsilon multiplied with uh, perturbing matrix P. Uh, then uh, it's easy to show that to the leading order in this control parameter epsilon, the change between uh, eigenvalues of perturbed matrix uh, x dash and matrix x itself, the difference, modulus of the difference between eigenvalue um, um, with um, index i uh, is proportional to epsilon and this coefficient of proportionality is just given by this, um, uh, this uh, matrix element between, of perturbation between left and right uh, eigenvectors corresponding to, uh, to unperturbed uh, eigenvalue lambda i. And by standard inequalities, we see that it's always bounded uh, by a norm of uh, this p, epsilon, and most importantly, this combination, uh, square root of uh, scalar uh, of, of the lengths uh, of uh, left and right eigenvector, product of left and right eigenvectors uh, corresponding to this eigenvalue. And uh, basically it shows that sensitivity uh, of eigenvalues to perturbation is controlled precisely by this factor, which is known uh, in the literature as eigenvalue condition number. And by cauchy schwarz inequality, this, uh, for, uh, if we uh, take this by orthogonal convention, then these chi's are always obviously larger or equal than one, and one can easily understand that it's one only uh, if x commutes with this joint when it's normal. And then necessarily for normal matrices, left and right are just the same set of uh, eigenvectors. So uh, it's natural uh, question arises, uh, how uh, well or ill uh, rather conditioned uh, are um, random matrices and paradigmatic example of non-self-adjoint random matrix is given by a matrix where all entries are taken independent, uh, identically distributed uh, Gaussian or uh, no, normal um, uh, uh, numbers, say with uh, mean zero and variance one. Um, in, in fact, it's uh, frequently uh, it's uh, convenient to normalize uh, these entries in, uh, uh, in such a way that they have they are, uh, they have this uh, proportionality factor scaling factor uh, one divided by size square root of size of the matrix times uh, um, uh, Gaussian distributed numbers with mean zero and variance one for and the, such ensemble is known as real Geneva. Um, if we take uh, rather uh, these entries to be complex with independently chosen uh, real and imaginary parts uh, scaled in the same way but with uh, variance one half, this is conventionally called a complex Geneva ensemble. So uh, what, uh, what is known, these are most studied uh, examples of uh, random matrices, uh, classical ensembles of random matrices. Um, so a lot of known, of course. So what we know about that, uh, we, we are, uh, we always will be interested in um, uh, large matrices. So when N is a big parameter, size of the matrix is a big parameter. So for real Geneva, 
um, uh, more or less uh, the picture is presented uh, in this view graph. Uh, majority of eigenvalues are concentrated in a circle of, uh, in this normalization will be in circle of radius one, but um, of, uh, still a big number, but zero proportion of eigenvalues will be exactly real. They will be on the real axis. Here, uh, we, uh, we even by guide of I see that there is some accumulation of eigenvalues on the real axis. And one can show that there will be uh, of order of square root of n eigenvalues uniformly distributed uh, along, uh, I mean, in the interval between minus one and one. And the rest, so n minus square root of n, so majority of eigenvalues will be more or less uniformly filling in um, uh, the circle with some uh, uh, going um, uh, beyond this uh, circle boundary, but will be with less and less probability when n grows. Um, for complex Geneva, just uh, picture is very much the same, uh, but there is no any accumulation on the real axis, so uh, just um, eigenvalues uh, more or less uniformly uh, fill in unit circle. Um, natural, uh, one can consider also more advanced versions of um, uh, ensembles of, uh, of random, um, random matrices, even with independent identically uh, distributed entries. One can consider entries uh, symmetric with respect to principal diagonal, namely x, j, k, and k, k j to be correlated. For Geneva, they are completely uncorrelated, so their covariance is zero. But one can consider, for example, in the real case, uh, their covariance to be controlled, uh, it's of order one of m uh, in this scaling, but it's uh, basically proportional to parameter tau, which we take between zero and one. So when it's zero, we are back to Geneva case. When it's one, uh, they are fully correlated, and in this case, necessarily just uh, they just coincide, xij equal to xjk. And in this case, we are back to symmetric matrices, which of course self-adjoint them, and then form uh, what is known as a real symmetric uh, ensemble of Gaussian orthogonal, Gaussian orthogonal ensemble of real symmetric uh, matrices. So uh, changing this parameter between zero and one just interpolates between um, Geneva case where eigenvalues are more or less inside the unit circle and uh, GUE case when all eigen n eigenvalues are uh, on the real uh, axis. Uh, and this interpolation happens in such a way that basically for tau between zero and one, but neither zero nor one, uh, this circle is squeezed in vertical direction, stretched in horizontal direction and uh, support of eigenvalue uh, density in uh, large and limit basically converges to um, to uh, um, interior of an ellipse. So such ensembles are known as elliptic, uh, um, frequently called ellipti elliptic Gaussian ensembles. Uh, I will show um, later on in some view graphs there uh, these ellipses, and uh, I will uh, discuss in uh, due time some of their properties. So these will be uh, types of ensembles which we, uh, which uh, eigenvectors we, we will try to address in the first half of this uh, presentation. So uh, for uh, complex Geneva matrices, a study of uh, these eigenvalue condition numbers and related quantities, uh, interestingly was initiated as is, in fact frequently happens in the story about random matrices, not in, by mathematicians, but by theoretical physicists but uh, by uh, John Choker and uh, Bernard Melech about uh, now more than 20, 22 years ago. Uh, there are two uh, uh, papers, uh, first short version in um, uh, physical review letters and then a much more extended detailed version in Journal of uh, Mathematical Physics uh, two years um, after that. And uh, basically, uh, these, uh, the, um, these papers uh, set the stage for subsequent analysis. So uh, Choker and Melik, in fact, introduced uh, not only condition numbers and uh, introduced and uh, tried to study successfully to some extent, uh, the whole matrix of inner products of this sort. So um, 
uh, inner product between left eigenvectors and separately times uh, between corresponding right eigenvectors. And uh, in fact, they called this a matrix of eigenvector overlaps. And this uh, matrix is very convenient to characterize non-orthogonality of set of left and right eigenvectors. For normal matrices, uh, basically this matrix will be diagonal with diagonal entries equal to one and all diagonal entries will be zero. So all deviations of this matrix from diagonality will signal about uh, non-normality and in some sense of non-orthogonality of left and right eigenvectors. In particular, diagonal entries of this matrix uh, will be uh, our uh, squared eigenvalue condition numbers. So how to, uh, in order to characterize uh, conveniently uh, the uh, first diagonal elements of the overlap matrix, uh, Choker and Melich, in, uh, Melich in, uh, introduced the following, what they called single point correlation function. So this is the following object. Um, we just uh, take these diagonal entries of this matrix and we, we multiply them with Dirac masses at the point where uh, eigenvalues are in the complex plane. We sum over all uh, n uh, eigenvalues and uh, we will see that correct scaling in this case is one over n squared in order to ensure a well-defined limit when n tends to infinity. Uh, angular brackets in my talk uh, mostly will denote uh, just ensemble average. So average over the probability density of this, uh, in this case, uh, CG means stands for complex Geneva, but one can introduce, of course, similar uh, objects for, uh, for also for real Geneva. Um, Choker and Melik themselves, they studied um, complex Geneva, and I will explain uh, most probably why, not because of lack of interest, but by, by, some, but by the fact that they were able really to evaluate this quantity in the large end limit asymptotics, and they showed by, I would say, by heuristic method, but which uh, can be uh, made rigorous and are now by now rigorous by um, I will mention later on, I will give account of uh, also rigorous and non-rigorous work in this direction. But anyway, they correctly uh, evaluated this limit and this is the answer. The answer for this uh, correlation function is just one over pi, one minus modulus of z squared. Okay, I forgot to uh, multiply by conditioning that modulus of z squared uh, is smaller than one. So, um, so inside the circle, inside that circle of radius one, where all eigenvalues are um, concentrated you know, for n tending to infinity. So this result is very interesting because it shows, uh, okay, if I just put instead of one over squared, one over n here and suppressed and replaced O's here with just unity, I would get uh, expected value of the empirical density. So this will be just mean, de mean eigenvalue density, which, is, which converges to this uniform density we know inside the unit circle. So the fact that scaling for the density is one over n, but scaling for, for this uh, correlation function is one over n squared, tells us that typically these diagonal entries for Geneva are just of order of n. So it means they are parametrically larger than one than uh, what we would expect for normal matrices. So we see that in this sense, uh, Geneva uh, ensemble uh, is formed, or Geneva matrices are quite not normal. Uh, these uh, condition numbers are parametrically bigger, they are proportional to the size of the matrix N. Okay, uh, in the same paper, in fact, um, uh, Choker and Melik also put a uh, conjecture which they verified only for n equal two, but also verified numerically, and that uh, allowed them to put forward it is, uh, for general n. They conjectured that uh, if we consider the probability density of these condition numbers, then uh, it has a power law tail, which decays as cube of this uh, random number. And we see that uh, for such uh, probability density, uh, only uh, first moment is finite and uh, say second moment will be already logarithmically divergent. So uh, that's why uh, if we uh, come back to, to this result, this is the only expectation which is finite in fact. 
here. And that's uh, why, um, uh, uh, okay, I will explain that for um, its counterpart for uh, real Geneva, uh, in fact, even first moment is uh, infinite, and that's probably why um, Choker and Melech restrict their attention mainly to complex Geneva. So this conjecture was, uh, in fact, settled uh, by two different methods and in si uh, slightly two different ways. For both real, uh, for complex eigenvalues of complex Geneva, first uh, in the paper by Borgate in Dubash um, a couple of years ago, and then uh, for bo both for complex eigenvalues of complex Geneva and the real eigenvalues of real Geneva in, uh, uh, in my paper. Uh, slightly later, uh, and basically, if I just um, uh, try to combine results of these two papers uh, about, uh, in particular, these condition numbers, uh, they can be uh, written in the following um, in the following compact form. So let us uh, we know that uh, these OIIs they are larger than one or, or larger or equal than one. And they, we expect that they scale with n. So let us introduce corresponding scaling and call this, uh, this variable t. Then one can find, uh, in fact, explicitly in the, uh, in the large n limit, and interestingly also, in fact, for any finite n. Uh, one can find explicitly the probability density function of this real number for eigenvalues uh, positioned uh, um, close to the point Z in complex plane, so this can be with this condition. And uh, in large and limit, it's very explicit and given by, by the following expression. And it did it, its tail um, for large uh, T is, uh, is of the form T uh, to beta plus one, where beta is uh, the so-called Dyson index, which uh, usually it uh, conventionally takes a uh, value beta equal one for real, for matrices with real entries. So for real Geneva will be beta equal one and the tail will be one over T squared. Uh, and uh, for complex, uh, in accordance with uh, Choker and Malik uh, conjecture, it's indeed uh, one over T to two plus one, so cube, so cubic tail. In fact, this tail one can show holds for, for any N indeed as um, Choker and Malik uh, conjecture. Um, so uh, what are main ingredients of this, uh, of this probability density? It's very explicit and main ingredients are just a row of that, uh, uh, which is uh, mean eigenvalue density. And also uh, this typical value for, for the overlap T, for the, for the variable T, which is given in case of beta equal two for complex Geneva, just by 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 the uh, by Choker uh, Choker Mele correlator showing that mean and typical is the same in this situation, uh, but for uh, mean does not exist for beta equal one for real Geneva for real eigenvalues of real Geneva, uh, but still expression for the mean uh, for the typical scale is very similar to to choker melek result in this situation. It's exa exactly the same one minus modulus z squared, but just with slightly different constants in front. Jan, so, can I ask a question? Yes. So you're, you're looking at the diagonal entries of this overlap matrix, <clears throat> but the non-diagonal entries also, I guess, have meaning with respect yes, to how- sure. A very important meaning. They're very essential. For example, uh, this was, I think, motivation by uh, Paul Bourget and uh, Guillaume Dubash. Uh, it's, they are very important, for example, for building uh, understanding of analog of Dyson Brownian motion. Uh, and uh, they, they also were, in fact, also addressed in the original paper by, uh, by Choker and Melech. And I will discuss some information about them. Uh, and uh, in this beautiful paper by Bourget and Dubash, they also uh, gave some more detailed information than uh, Choker and Melek. I won't give all uh, this valuable information. I mainly concentrate on these diagonal entries uh, in my talk, but I will give some references and mentioning uh, some of these results later on. You are completely right. Yes. They're very interesting and more difficult, of, uh, in my opinion, more difficult object than diagonal entries. And can I just clarify, so PNZT, so 
T is this diagonal overlap factor. Yes. And, and, and that is just conditioning of being at point Z in complex planes. Okay. And, and so the fact that it's the ii entry, it doesn't matter which i you choose. It could be the one one. Yes, because it's uh, this conditioning, if you like, uh, uh, is done in the same way. I sum, uh, uh, I multiply with delta of mass and sum of all i's. So this is this in this way. So this is exactly p n of z z t, and make it uh, expectation of this. So this is how it's done. Okay. So. Um, now, what uh, in subsequent paper with uh, Tarnovsky, we tried to um, to shed some light of what happens uh, with uh, these the same objects for for these deformations, elliptic deformations of Geneva, when we introduce correlations between um, entries uh, symmetric with respect to principal diagonal. Um, for we were able to settle this question uh, question for uh, real eigenvalues of uh, elliptic uh, real elliptic ensembles, uh, but uh, it remains open for uh, both for complex eigenvalues and for of real elliptic and for even for um, complex eigenvalues of uh, complex elliptic. Uh, it seems to be technic. Uh, uh, difficulties uh, are technical, but uh, quite, uh, I would say, quite technical. So it's, 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 uh, there are some technical challenges in doing this. Uh, but for real eigenvalues of real Geneva, one can show that up to some uh, natural uh, rescaling, basically the answer is the same. The answer is the same, uh, just typical scale changes. It involves, uh, okay, uh, so let us discuss the setting. So we have now all eigenvalues uh, inside an ellipse with a semi, uh, pre, uh, larger semi-axis given by one plus tau, where tau is this uh, parameter which controls, um, which controls uh, correlation. And uh, vertical semi-axis is one minus tau. So when tau tends to one towards a uh, symmetric case, uh, this uh, everything is squeezed towards uh, the real axis, but otherwise there is this um, ellipse, and eigenvalues are still accumulate uh, more and more eigenvalues. In fact, accumulated uh, on on uh, real axis, still for tau uh, strictly smaller than one, uh, their uh, number is of order of square root of n, but coefficient in front uh, grows. Uh, in fact, density uh, on, on the real axis is given here, mean density. And uh, basically, after natural rescaling of Z with the radio, with the largest uh, axis of this, uh, of this with, with this distance along the real axis of this uh, ellipse, uh, typical scale remains the same. So what um, uh, this is uh, basically the message that uh, more or less properties of eigenvectors uh, in elliptic case and in uh, Geneva case uh, seem to be very much uh, the same. Uh, what uh, one can uh, still study and what is interesting is what happens in two uh, new scaling limits. Namely, one can try to approach the boundary of the support. So uh, go into so-called edge regime from the bulk regime and uh, st uh, study what will be there. Uh, we have already hint here, if one approaches the boundary of the support, which is given uh, Z approaching one plus tau, obviously this typical value tends to zero. So we expect that it should be weaker, somewhat weaker uh, non-normality or weaker con uh, ill conditioning. These numbers uh, have, uh, I mean, their scale uh, probably changes and indeed we will see it changes. And another interesting limit, what happens if tau tends to one and we approach really symmetric matrices? We also expect that then non-normality should be uh, weakened. So this will be considered uh, in the next slides. And the first is uh, just um, exactly... Um, uh, Before you go on, there was a question uh, Reda asked. I guess as a follow-up to my question, is it true that as in the Hermitian case, we morally have that non-diagonal entries being small is equivalent to strong delocalization of eigenvectors. 
no, not at all. Localization has nothing to do with uh, this phenomenon. All eigenvectors are delocalized in this case. For Geneva, they're delocalized. In fact, there are separate papers which study this delocalization. It's just that left and right are very different. This is uh, one, uh, message. Message is uh, that parametrically they are, they are different. Uh, this bi of course, biorthogonality keeps them biorthogonal, but they are very uh, uh, far from being orthogonal inside themselves. This is the case. When we approach, no, okay, for normal matrices, left and right coincide and they form itself orthogonal uh, basis. That's why this matrix is diagonal with uh, diagonal entries equal one. And deviation from this orthogonality, that's why I call non-orthogonality uh, non factor, not me, but uh, everyone calls them, uh, many people call them non-orthogonality factors, uh, because they reflect this property of being non-orthogonal within separately left and right uh, eigenvectors. But it has nothing to do with uh, localization. It's in, uh, localization is a completely separate issue, it's interesting, but it's not in this setting, we won't see it in this setting. Okay, uh, now what I mentioned, uh, one can approach the edges and then one finds, one can uh, recover from the general results that we have, the behavior of these condition numbers uh, at the edge, and they uh, turned out to be, uh, okay, uh, this edge regime is at the distance one over square root of n from the edge point, which is from, uh, at, at point one plus tau. And in that vicinity, uh, then these condition numbers, they scale not with n, but with square root of n. So we see parametrically weaker non-normality. So th uh, those eigenvectors which correspond to eigenvalues uh, close to the uh, edge of the support, uh, they are still parametrically larger, uh, uh, this condition number than uh, for normal matrices, but this, uh, still they are smaller than in the bulk. It's only square root of an enhancement rather than n. And uh, uh, another uh, question is what happens if I uh, try to squeeze it further and further such that vertical dimension becomes, uh, tends to zero, tends to zero because this, this uh, size is one minus tau, so tau tends to one. Tau tends to one, uh, it turns out that uh, interesting regime, scaling regime, is to allow scaling of uh, a tau approaching one with the rate which scales as one over size of the matrix. And if one uh, fixes this product in the limit one minus tau with n as a parameter, then this opens the possibility of studying a new scaling regime. This scaling regime is natural to call uh, the regime of almost symmetric or weakly asymmetric matrices. And then uh, the density of uh, real eigenvalues, uh, uh, interestingly, in this regime is not surprising. Matrices approach uh, symmetric matrices when all, eigen and all n eigenvalues are, are real and on the real axis. So it's not surprising that, that finite proportion now of eigenvalues uh, are on the real axis. And their density is given by this expression, which involves as a prefactor just standard Wigner semicircle density typical for G or E, but it deviates from it. Uh, the, uh, the fact that it's still not all eigenvalues on the real axis is controlled by this uh, factor. And this expression was, was first found by uh, Yefetov in his uh, 97 paper. Now we can ask what happens um, uh, if um, we study this non-normality. Not surprisingly, uh, these matrices turned out to be not only weakly asymmetric, but also weakly non-normal. In which sense, uh, typical uh, these uh, condition numbers or diagonal overlaps, they are now of order of unity. They are larger than unity. One can find their uh, distribution or the density of their distribution. Uh, so, um, but they are of order one. They are no longer enhanced neither by n nor by square root of n but just of order one, larger than one, random numbers, uh, whose density conditioned on their position is given explicitly uh, by the formula presented in this view graph. So um, basically we now understand quite well 
real eigenvalues of this um, of these elliptic ensembles, but re a lot of questions remain open. Um, here I just discussed only the, these diagonal entries. I will separately discuss um, uh, in the next uh, slide uh, what is known about briefly about all diagonal entries. But for diagonal entries, uh, we do not know um, about uh, complex um, about uh, condition numbers for eigenvectors corresponding to complex uh, eigenvalues of real Geneva and its uh, elliptic generalization. Uh, and we know very little, uh, relatively little, uh, beyond Gaussian case also. So we do not know about universality. Uh, although we expect, and numerics shows, and some uh, partial results show that uh, these re mentioned results to large extent are universal. Okay, uh, I should just here finish this, uh, this particular part. Uh, uh, with mentioning interest in related studies. In fact, uh, Chokri and Melech were brought, I believe, to um, study these uh, questions about uh, ill conditioning, uh, not mainly by um, uh, interesting questions of stability of uh, matrix eigenvalues under perturbations. Uh, this type of questions usually asked in medical uh, mathematics literature, but they were interested in understanding behavior of large systems of coupled uh, linear random differential equations. So uh, suppose we have this uh, Geneva matrix uh, X, we multiply it with control parameter G and we subtract one uh, and consider just a linear system of, uh, of, of uh, equations for vector U, uh, n-dimensional vector U. So this is linear system, so it's very uh, easy formally to solve it. Uh, by just the matrix exponential, right? It will be given by matrix exponential acting on uh, um, initial value of, um, of uh, vector u. And then depending on, um, uh, so for, sm for g small enough, this one will dominate and all solutions will exponentially decay towards the origin. Uh, increasing g, we uh, eventually come to the critical situation uh, such that the uh, decay will be uh, power law. And then with further increase in G, uh, spectrum of X will, uh, will uh, exceed, uh, really will counteract uh, this um, identity matrix and uh, solutions will be exponentially growing, uh, going away from uh, origin, which is um, uh, in linear language uh, of dynamical system is interpreted as loss of stability. Equations of, of, of this uh, type of uh, linearly, uh, linear um, randomly coupled differential equations, they are quite popular in analysis of ecological equilibria and some other questions. So people are interested in uh, studying their behavior. So uh, what um, Choker and Mele found that due to non-normality and precisely due to non-orthogonality of uh, left and right eigenvectors, at criticality, precisely when decay of U towards origin is power law, uh, norm decays as one over T rather than T minus three halves, which would be if we consider a uh, matrix which is uh, shares with uh, Geneva, uh, it's uh, mean eigenvalue density, so uniform inside the unit circle, but it's normal. So we see that non-normality changes uh, asymptotic decay. This result was shown for, and again, uh, not completely rigorously, but correctly by Chogri and Melech. But uh, very recently, there was a very nice paper by Erdos, Kruger, and Renfrew, who rigorously proved that for a large class of matrices with independent, uh, identically distributed entries with some conditions on moments. So now uh, they actually proved universality of this result. So um, uh, that's why I wanted to mention this, uh, this paper. Now, uh, let me briefly discuss extensions of uh, this uh, question that we just um, discussed. So uh, first of all, I should mention that uh, first fully rigorous ver verification of this choker melic uh, uh, result for the um, uh, one point correlator uh, related to non-orthogonality 
uh, for Geneva case was done in a work by Walter Sinstar in uh, five years ago. Uh, and since then, there was a, a surge of interest both in uh, theoretical physics and in mathematical physics, so both rigorous and uh, semi-heuristic and heuristic considerations. And now analogs of this result uh, are obtained for large classes of, uh, of uh, non-normal matrices. In particular, there is a large class which satisfies so-called conditions of single ring theorem, uh, where uh, this is uh, these are conditions ensuring that eigenvalues in the complex plane they fill in uh, uh, an annulus, not uh, really a ring. Uh, sorry, not um, a circle, but an annulus in um, um, in the complex plane. This is known as a single ring theorem. And in conditions of the theorem, uh, these authors uh, a few years ago uh, obtained. Uh, interesting generalization uh, formula, uh, general formula for that class of matrices, uh, generalizing choker melech uh, correlate. For some other classes, uh, generalizations were found by uh, Grell and Warhol, uh, uh, Bourdain collaborators, and uh, most recently for other uh, classes by, in, in the work by Dubash, and work by Dubash is rigorous. Uh, others, I think I would call some of, of their results are close to rigorous, some of uh, their results are heuristic. Now, uh, a lot of work was devoted to uh, characterizing of diagonal entries of this uh, overlap, uh, non-orthogonality matrix. So this can be conveniently char uh, characterized by calculating the following uh, two-point correlation function involving uh, delta masses at points Z1 and Z2 in, in complex plane and uh, studying uh, their, mm, uh, the entries of uh, non-orthogonality matrix corresponding to uh, eigenvectors corresponding um, to uh, those eigenvalues located uh, close to those two points in the complex plane. Uh, Choker and Melech uh, were able uh, mm, to develop a heuristic method of evaluating asymptotics for fix Z1 not equal to Z2 of this object. So Z1 and Z2 fixed and to infinity. And they found uh, this asymptotic result for the correlator showing that it decays as some distance between the points. Uh, this result was um, rigorously verified, I believe the first uh, in paper by Bourget and Dubash. And also they provided a very interesting uh, extension of this to um, to, to situation when Z1 and Z2 come to the distances comparable with mean separation between uh, typical eigenvalues of, G, of complex Geneva. And uh, this is, uh, these are very nice results. Uh, in recent years, there was, a, uh, as I mentioned, a surge of interest in various aspects of non orthogonality of eigenvectors of uh, not only of Geneva, but of related ensembles and various incarnations of non-normal matrices. And here I just give, <coughs> I'm sure, incomplete, but hopefully representative list of some of the papers in, in this direction. Now, uh, this finishes uh, the first part of my talk. So how I'm doing? I still have, I hope, uh, about 15 minutes. Am I right? Yes, 15 minutes. Exactly. Uh, OK, great. I'll try to give a very brief, probably I won't be able to finish, but at least to give a flavor of why uh, theoretical physicists are very actively, and for a long time, for more than 20 years already, uh, interested in this non-orthogonality of left and right eigenvalues. And this related not that much to properties of, um, of Geneva ensembles, but uh, of our uh, different type of ensemble of non-normal uh, uh, random matrices. And in order to understand, or at least to give a flavor of what is uh, this um, setting, I'll try to give a crash course uh, in a random matrix approach to so-called chaotic wave scattering. But before we start scattering, let us consider a situation without any scattering. Let us consider a two-dimensional domain uh, offers quite a, some, some generic form. I just uh, take a smooth, a reasonably smooth curve and uh, consider the domain inside it. 
And on this domain, in two dimensions, I consider the following operator minus Laplacian and uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions along the boundary of this domain. Then uh, <clears throat> one can study for such an operator, for such a um, uh, boundary problem, one can uh, study its spectrum. And uh, there is a famous conjecture by, it's called in the literature, by, by Igor Giannoni Schmidt conjecture, that uh, if uh, this uh, shape is generic, what is generic is of course, uh, 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 should be specified. But uh, now I'm not going to give any um, rigorous statements, but rather uh, some um, vague statements, which nevertheless uh, seems to be uh, meaningful in some, uh, in some setting. Namely, for whatever we call uh, generic domain, um, physicists expect that if one takes, uh, if one say discards uh, first um, thousand of uh, eigenvalues uh, counting from, uh, from, uh, from the lowest possible eigenvalue uh, of this, uh, of this uh, boundary value problem, uh, minus Laplacian plus uh, directly boundary conditions. And then uh, one studies long stretches of uh, eigenvalues of this, uh, of this problem uh, high enough, then they will be eventually, uh, if we go high enough in the spectrum, there uh, these uh, sequences of eigenvalues will be indistinguishable from um, uh, eigenvalues of larger random matrices. This is of course a very vague statement, but nevertheless, uh, everyone in theoretical physics uh, believes that uh, there is a certain truth behind it. Of course, uh, there is a lot of effort trying to verify it and there are some partial successes, but it's largely open as a conjecture. And this uh, is known as the main conjecture of uh, quantum chaos. Now, uh, suppose now that we'd like to to study this system experimentally. One can build, in fact, an, a, a resonator of this shape and try to, uh, to excite um, really oscillations in this system. For example, uh, send some uh, electromagnetic waves inside Y antenna and then collect uh, reflected waves and uh, try to study what uh, some characteristics of this system. Necessarily, such system then uh, is described by so-called scattering approach. Uh, what means scattering? Scattering means that we send some waves on the system and then we collect uh, reflected waves. Each wave, uh, if we just uh, simplify the problem and consider antenna as just one dimensional waveguides, then in each of these waveguides, really uh, waves are superposition of incoming and outgoing plane waves with some, uh, with their uh, wave vector uh, K related to the frequency or to, to the energy of incoming waves. And then uh, scattering is just, uh, or sc main object will be, for study will be uh, energy of frequency dependent scattering matrix, which relates amplitudes, A's, of uh, all incoming waves uh, here by um, by arrows which point uh, inwards towards the domain, I just uh, schematically show uh, amplitudes of uh, in front of incoming uh, waves in uh, all channels. And scattering matrix linearly relates uh, the vector of M, where M is the number of antenna. So if there is only one antenna, there will be just a single, uh, single incoming amplitude. If there are three antennas, there will be three incoming amplitudes, and they're related linearly because of linearity of, uh, of uh, Maxwell equation, describing uh, electromagnetic pro propagation. They uh, related to uh, the, uh, the vector of the same dimension, describing uh, uh, amplitudes of outgoing waves. And this is the main object which physicists like to understand. Uh, one can build, if we believe, that indeed in this conjecture, that highly excited or uh, highly lying uh, eigenstate of this system when it's really close, when there is no any antennas sending signals, were described by 
uh, by um, well described by random matrices. Then uh, next natural step is to build, uh, really to build a corresponding operator for this scattering system using self-adjoint extension of this problem. And then it, uh, one can, in this way, one can construct scattering matrix in terms of uh, basically of this operator which described closed system. And uh, if we model uh, this operator which described closed system by random matrix, it turns out that the most informative uh, or one of the most informative characteristics of scattering matrix, namely positions of its poles in the complex plane, which are known in physical literature as resonances, and which in fact um, uh, nothing else as uh, what uh, discrete, uh, discrete frequencies of oscillations in system without this antenna are converted due to presence of, uh, of antenna, which make uh, this uh, system now not closed, but open. Uh, it turns out that poles of the scattering matrix uh, are described by non-normal and non-self-adjoint matrix of the, following, uh, of the following shape. So it is called effective non-self-adjoint uh, random matrix Hamiltonian in physical literature. And it's constructed from uh, from a random matrix characterizing the system, for example, if we take for simplicity GOE or GUE, just by deforming it by a finite rank deformation with I in front, and this finite rank deformation uh, is uh, made of uh, basically of some characteristics characterizing how these antennas are coupled to our resonator. But mathematically, it just can be looked at as finite rank deformation of uh, self-adjoint uh, matrix, but of the special form. And of course, uh, it's uh, formally uh, never Ginebra. Um, In fact, these matrices gamma can be considered, uh, well, uh, it, it's not that important. You can consider them, if, in fact, even fixed, fixed uh, finite rank deformation, non-random. Or one can say the, these Ws, which we use um, to for, um, construct this matrix as random, uh, there will be not uh, much difference in the end. Uh, and this is ensemble which is of much interest to, uh, to physicists. So uh, for such an ensemble, first task uh, was, uh, was to, when the physicists realized that this is very interesting ensemble, it was about 30 years ago. And first meaningful paper on that is by Hake and collaborators in 92. They were able, not rigorously, but correctly, um, uh, calculate uh, analog of, of, of uh, basically of mean eigenvalue density for this uh, type of ensemble. Now all uh, eigenvalues, were, which, are, which are called resonances in this setting, they will occupy uh, necessarily some domain in the lower half of complex plane. Why? Because this gamma is non-negative. Uh, non non -negative. Question? Some questions? Some questions? Oh, so, sorry. No, I think uh, it's feedback from somebody's mic. Oh, ah, okay. So, um, uh, this gamma is, is uh, positive, uh, is non-negative, so it's is, it has uh, exactly M, it's finite rank, so it has M uh, positive eigenvalues and N minus M zero eigenvalues. So obviously uh, all eigenvalues of, of this non-self-adjoint matrix uh, will be in the lower half of complex plane and they form a cloud where, which, uh, I mean, may resemble an ellipse, but it's not ellipse. And also density is not uniform inside but there is explicit expression for its shape and also explicit expression for its density. I do not give it here, it's a, a little bit cumbersome, but it's very explicit. And interestingly, if you increase further, uh, in fact, uh, rank of this, of this gamma, then uh, there may be splitting of this cloud into two clouds and some interesting physical phenomena. I do not have time to discuss it. And this happens if rank gamma is comparable with, with size uh, n. So if uh, gamma basically, uh, if ratio of the rank of gamma uh, to size of gamma 
is a finite fraction. However, uh, this situation is less interesting physically because usually one uh, uh, inserts uh, just one, two, three, maybe 10, maybe 100, but a fixed number of antennas. Therefore, uh, we are interested uh, in uh, finite frame deformation mostly. Uh, in this situation, uh, okay, I will discuss what is known in this situation later on if I have time. But uh, it turned out uh, that uh, non orthogonality of eigenvectors of these matrices plays a very essential role for physical observable. For example, one, can, may, one may ask question, and this question was asked, I believe, first by Savin and Sokolov uh, in, in, in their very nice paper. Uh, if one prepares uh, or really um, uh, just sends uh, some signal inside this system Y antenna and then switch off uh, the antenna, then there will be decay from this system. And it turns out that the law of this decay is correct, uh, is very much controlled by this non orthogonality overlap matrix. And it will be very, uh, it will be quite different from the situation when uh, the matrix uh, is uh, normal. And then turned out that if one converts also uh, in different application by Shamiras, uh, Benaker and collaborators, that if one uses uh, these resonators with a good purpose, namely for building a laser, it turns out that one can build a laser from such uh, cavities, then properties of, of these lasers will also will be controlled by non-orthogonality overlap matrix. Uh, because of this fact, uh, in fact, physicists will, for a long time, for more than 20 years, try to understand properties of uh, this, uh, the whole matrix of non orthogonality but success is very limited. Uh, this is quite a difficult uh, question. Even uh, heuristically, it's difficult to get uh, insights into this. Okay. Uh, before finishing, so I have uh, just a few few minutes. I just mentioned two, uh, maybe uh, two two, two uh, questions. It turns out uh, that uh, not surprisingly, if we remember that non-normality controls sensitivity of um, eigenvalues, positions of eigenvalues, uh, it turns out that one can find uh, experimental verification in this scattering system of this fact, namely one can slightly perturb this cavity. For example, take a hammer and hit this cavity, making a, a cavity in it or something, but not, not ruin it completely, but just change it. And then ask uh, what will be a shift in positions in complex plane of these poles, of resonance poles. It turns out that one can answer statistics of these uh, poles in a way similar to what uh, I showed in the first part about Geneva and make some prediction for power or tails of uh, these shifts. And they were verified experimentally in very nice experiment. And finally, I finish here because uh, I run out of time. I just wanted to show that for a single, uh, there is one, and, uh, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, only one model in this class, namely when deformation is rank one. So the simplest possible deformation, rank one, for which one can explicitly find uh, all interesting characteristics. One can find the eigenvalue density one can, in, in the complex plane, one can find uh, diagonal and off-diagonal um, correlators explicitly fully non-perturbatively. Uh, I mean, they are given by some integrals. In fact, even one can uh, perform these integrations, but formulas will be even uh, less pleasant, but they are very explicit. Uh, but this is the only case uh, known so far. And uh, I'm, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope uh, I've shown that these are interesting objects uh, and I'm finishing here. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. We, uh, we have time if uh, anybody wants to unmute and, and ask a question uh, about either of the subjects of the talk. So I'm curious, so, so you were talking about essentially applications of, of this. Yes. Are, are people really, you know, are, there, are people using this sort of technology? You know, this is- uh, People, okay, okay. experimentalists uh, are interested in measuring something. 
Uh, and uh, interestingly, last year, uh, people uh, in New York, uh, uh, experimentalists measured some, uh, some scattering in these type of systems and showed that they can measure uh, influence of non-orthogonality. Uh, and so I find it uh, quite quite interesting that uh, they really and they refer. I mean, uh, first they discovered the original paper by Chopper and Melech, but uh, then uh, they contacted me and we dis uh, <laughs> discussed that they can measure quite quite uh, non-trivial information. They can measure basically this, uh, not only diagonal but also off diagonal. And so this, so the, the theory really matches the experiments to some um, Theory is not enough to explain fully the experiment, but in, in cases it can be compared, it shows some uh, trends which can be explained by existing theory. But in this situation, interestingly, they can measure more than can be explained at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. Other uh, questions or comments? While, while people are thinking. Um, so I'll, I'll remind you that um, in two hours, uh, Jinho Bike will speak. Um, I think it's a, it's a separate link. So you just go to- uh, Excuse me, I have a question. Oh yeah. Uh, maybe silly, but uh, because uh, for what I see, these are uh, all exact results, uh, also in scattering theory. And uh, there are, uh, uh, scattering matrices that uh, are exactly known in the literature, like the one for uh, integrable systems. Exactly. And in these systems, uh, the scattering matrix uh, is factorized uh, into body scatterings. Uh, and so I was wondering if um, uh, from these formalisms it's possible to uh, get some of those results, because those results are highly, very highly non-trivial uh, and um, that would be uh, interesting to very interesting question but i believe uh, the answer is most probably negative why because i understand that what you mean is a kind of built ansatz or something like this uh and indeed yes, integrable, uh, yes indeed it describes integrable system uh the whole point here that you see uh, there is uh, sometimes confusion random matrices have on one hand have some very intimate relations with integrable systems. We know that uh, integrability plays a very important role in some of random matrix results. However, uh, some, uh, some, somehow, uh, maybe unfortunately, maybe fortunately, I don't know, but as a matter of fact, physicists you use random matrix theory to describe non-integrable systems. They describe chaotic yeah, Mm -hmm. And really, they believe that spectra of generic chaotic systems, uh, their quantum counterparts, are described by random matrix theory. In this sense, it's used here. And in this sense, uh, scattering matrix can be expressed in terms of random matrices. So scattering matrix is itself random. It can be okay, expressed so by, uh, in terms of uh, Cayley transform of uh, random matrices used to describe uh, Hamiltonians or these wave operators, as I described for these cavities. And okay. then from this setting, we try to recover properties of poles. It's quite different from, uh, from Bert Anzas. At least I do not see any relation, at least along these lines, but it does not mean that it does not exist. No, no, basically here, uh, the dynamic has to be chaotic. Uh, yes. Otherwise, uh, okay, great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Paul, did you have a question? I see you unmuted yourself. I actually just arrived five minutes ago, too late. I, uh, I missed most of the talk, okay. so I will not ask questions. Okay. okay. Anyway, nice to see you. Okay. My message, uh, one of my messages was that uh, these type of ensembles, uh, I mean, finite rank non-self-adjoint deformations of uh, standard random matrices 
they uh, they are not much studied. There are some results. I, I had no time to discuss. There are some results and even some rigorous results uh, about them, but not that uh, that many. Okay. okay. Well, so any you know the the video will be available and the slides are linked here. Uh, so let's all thank Jan again for a very nice talk. Thank you. I'm, I stopped sharing then. Okay. 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 And thank you for uh, coming in on a, I guess, a Friday afternoon. So, okay. Um, and uh, I'll see uh, at least some number of people for the next talk in two hours when Jin Hill will speak. So, until then.